Good evening, my name is Cora Fox and I'm the Director of Government Relations for the Iowa Cattlemen's Association. I'd like to welcome everyone to tonight's webinar about an important industry topic, the Asian Longhorn Tick. As the Asian Longhorn Tick continues to spread throughout the United States, it is important now more than ever that Iowa cattlemen be informed. Tonight, our guest speaker, Dr. Katie Martin, will provide an in-depth overview of the Asian Longhorn Tick, along with clinical signs, management and treatment options, and how to report findings. This information may prove useful in protecting your herd and your bottom line if the invasive Asian longhorn tick does come to Iowa. I'm gonna start by introducing Dr. Katie Martin. She earned her Doctor of Veterinary Medicine from Iowa State University College of Veterinary Medicine in 2018. She is currently a resident in parasitology and is earning her PhD in the Department of Veterinary Pathology at Iowa State under the guidance of Dr. Matt Brewer. She is involved in diagnostic service, teaching, and research. Her research focuses on parasites of production animal species. Dr. Martin, I'm gonna hand the presentation over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Cora. All right, let me get my PowerPoint pulled up here. All right, so as Cor said, I'm going to give you an overview about the invasive Asian longhorn tick. We also will um, start out just by going through kind of some tick basics so that everything that I say later on makes a little bit more sense. So I'm happy to take questions throughout the presentation, so please feel free to use that chat feature. Um, if anything that I'm saying doesn't make sense or if it triggers a question, um, I really appreciate everyone's attention. I don't know that I could get um, vet students to tune in to us in PM. <laughs> Getting a note that I am not being heard. Is I can hear you. Okay. Dr. Martin, I can hear you. It might be that's on their end. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, um, like I said, happy to take questions throughout um, and really appreciate your attention during this presentation, um, even if we are getting into the evening hours. So not sure I could convince vet students to tune in this late at night, but I really appreciate the enthusiasm. Oops, and if I can remember how to use PowerPoint real quick. So like I said, we're gonna start off just by talking about some tick basics. So we'll talk a little bit about the life cycle, um, morphology and how that helps us identify these invasive longhorn ticks, uh, the role that ticks play in disease transmission, um, specific ticks that are really most relevant to cattle here in Iowa. Then we will go through um, specifics on Haemophysalis longicornis. So that's the scientific name of this invasive Asian longhorn tick. Um, and then we'll touch on some tick control options at the end as well. So just your basic information about ticks. Ticks are all obligate blood feeding ectoparasites. So these are parasites that are gonna be found on the outside of animals and they are getting their nutrients by feeding off of the blood of that host. So because we have these blood feeding parasites, if we have a heavy enough infestation that can result in anemia in that host animal. Ticks are relatively large compared to a lot of our other ectoparasites and they are long lived. So these um, organisms can actually live for several years even with just periodic feeding. So I find that to be very impressive. Um, most of our parasites are not that long lived. Importantly, ticks can act as vectors for a wide range of pathogens. So everything from viruses, bacteria to parasites. So they're really, um, their capabilities of vectoring disease um, spread far and wide. And so that really is our main concern um, in terms of disease and the, the effects of ticks is gonna be their ability to transmit disease. So the tick life cycle involves four stages. So um, we start with an egg. That egg is gonna hatch to release a larval tick. Those larvae will molt into a nymph. And then finally, the nymph stage will molt into an adult. Those adults will breed and then produce more eggs. 
jumping into a little bit more specifics on the life cycle. So if you've ever heard a parasitology presentation, we simply can't resist talking about the, the life of the organism. So I have to give you a little bit of background information here. Um, ticks can vary in uh, the number of hosts that they require for their life cycle. So the most basic life cycle is going to be a one host tick. And that's where we will have um, that larval stage, that first um, tick stage that's going to get onto a host and be feeding. And they will actually stay on that same host all the way through their adult stage when they will finally drop off and the female will then um, release eggs into the environment. So those ticks, they stay on that host for their whole life cycle. And that varies from two and three host ticks, which are much more common. These ticks will basically drop off of the animal in between each stage in order to molt. So three host ticks, that's gonna be what most of our ticks are. That's what this Asian longhorn tick is. So we have larval ticks be on one host, they'll feed, They'll drop off of that host, be in the environment, molt to the nymph stage, get onto a new host, feed, drop off, and repeat that um, molting process to then become an adult. Um, and so these um, different life cycles come into play when we talk about disease control. So if we have ticks that are feeding on a variety of hosts, that means that we have more opportunity for disease transmission. Um, it's much easier to deal with ticks that are one host ticks. So if you're at all familiar with cattle fever in Texas, that is spread by a tick known as Rhipicephalus. So that is a one host tick. And because that tick spends its whole life cycle on cattle and a select other few larger mammals, um, they've been able to really control that disease and almost completely eradicate it from Texas just by dipping um, the cattle in anti-tick medications. Um, and so obviously that's much more straightforward. We're dealing with a single host species than when we may need to control um, different stages on everything from a um, to deer like we have with Ixodes, the deer tick. So here is basically what I just said in picture form. I know sometimes these are a little bit easier to digest. So um, on the left here, we have our one host tick life cycle. So we have a female tick that's gonna lay eggs in the environment. Those larval ticks are gonna hop onto a host and they're gonna stay on that host all the way up through that adult stage. And then we come right back to the beginning here. And that is in contrast with our three host ticks where we will have adult females releasing eggs into the environment, our larval stage that's gonna hop onto one animal, in this case, a squirrel. They'll feed on that squirrel, release into the environment, become a nymph. That nymph will then um, get onto a new host, in this case, a rabbit, um, feed then, then release before the adult stage is on the final host. So um, just a little bit of background that'll make um, hopefully our control apps uh, make a little bit more sense later on. All right, so now we will get into a bit about tick morphology. So um, not sure how many of you will be doing in-depth tick ID, but I think hopefully this will um, give you a little bit of a view into what we are looking for when we receive these ticks for identification. Um, and hopefully we'll give you just a little bit of an idea so that maybe you can sort of um, make a couple of judgment calls and determine at least which ticks in your particular area seem to be causing the majority of problems. So all ticks um, are arachnids. That means that they have eight legs. So the only caveat to that is going to be our larval stage. That first stage in the life cycle only has six legs. So um, you can really impress someone if you ever find a tick. You can say, well, I know this one's a larval stage because it only has six legs. So good party trick guests. Um, the first part of the anatomy that I'm going to point out is the sputum. So that is this um, portion here that has sort of cream color uh, marking on it. So that's going to be our sputum. That varies between males and females. So this tick is a female, 
And I know that because the sputum does not cover the entire body of the tick. So in females, it only extends about a third of the way down the body. And that allows for the female to take a larger blood meal to become more engorged. In a male tick, that covering will come all the way down the end of the body. Um, so that's one of the first things if I get a tick in for identification, I like to say, all right, am I dealing with a male or a female? Um, and so I will let sputum to make that determination. The next thing that I like to look at is the length of the palps, um, which are basically the parts. So those are the um, portions that are actually going to attach to the host. So it is very important if you're removing a tick, if you want us to get a good idea, it's really helpful if you remove that properly. Um, grasping that tick kind of as close to the mouth parts as you can and removing kind of in a one quick motion. Um, because if we leave those mouth parts in the animal, not only can that lead to infection and irritation, but also it does make our um, identification more challenging. So this tick, and I know we don't have another to compare it to at the moment, but these are relatively short mouth parts. Um, so when we talk about our amblyoma ticks, which is the lone star tick, those mouth parts are going to extend quite a bit farther um, out. And so it can be really helpful as one of the first kind of obvious things that you notice is just the relative length of the mouth parts. Next thing that we look at is going to be getting a little more technical. It's the shape of a structure called the basis capitulum. So that is actually the portion of the tick that is between the mouth parts and the body of the tick. So it's this small portion right here. And it actually is much easier to see from the belly portion of the tick. Um, and so it's this structure that attaches the mouth parts to the body of the tick. And in this case, we have a pretty rectangular basis capitulum. When we get to some of our specific ticks at the end, you'll see that some have um, a more hexagonal shape here where there's actually kind of a, a flare or pointed region of that basis capitulum. So again, these are features that are kind of going to vary between um, different ge genera of ticks. So um, whether we're talking about a deer tick, the Ixodes genus versus Amblyoma, the Lone Star tick, um, those are kind of areas that we can look at to help us determine what genus of tick we're dealing with. Uh, another aspect we can look at is the orientation of the anal groove, which is not particularly clear in this picture. I do have another image coming up where that will be clearer, um, but basically to see is it pointed toward the head or away from the head. Um, so only Ixodes, again that's the deer tick, so the tick that's responsible for spreading Lyme disease, only Ixodes has an anal groove that is oriented toward the head, uh, called an anterior groove. Um, so that's a really helpful feature because if we see that, we know right away that it's Ixodes, um, and then we don't have to pay as much attention to some of those other features. Makes the ID a little bit easier. The next thing that we look at are the presence or absence of spoons. So if you can see these little kind of square ridges around the outside or the perimeter of this tick, um, those are called festoons. Some types of ticks will have festoons, some will not. Um, and so the presence or absence of that structure as well can be helpful in determining what genus we are dealing with. Lastly, and this is sort of the, the one that everyone wants to look at because it's generally the most obvious, uh, but it's not always very consistent. So I always tell my students not to rely on this particular morphologic feature, but when it is there, it can be helpful. And that is ornamentation of the sputum. So again, the sputum is this really tough, um, harder part of the body of the tick. And so in this case, where we have sort of this cream um, yellow coloration here, we refer to that as ornamentation. Um, so if basically there's any coloring of sputum, we call it an ornate tick. Um, and so that can be helpful, kind of depending on the case, and to specifics where it, it does make the ID quite obvious. Um, so can be helpful, but not to be heavily relied upon.
So here I just wanted to show, as I mentioned, so our, our female ticks, this sputum is going to extend about a third to a half of the way down the body of the tick, um, almost like they're wearing a necklace. So that can be helpful for um, people to remember that the female tick is wearing a necklace. Um, versus the male where we have that sputum is covering actually the entire body of that tick. And so you can see these are both ornate ticks. So we have our kind of cream colored uh, markings on that sputum and on the male that's extending all the way across the body. Um, and then this other image, again, this is probably not something um, that you would appreciate unless you have access to a microscope to look at these ticks a little bit closer up. Um, but that's the anal groove. So here we have this, if the head of the tick is up here at this end, this anal groove is kind of pointing towards the head. So that's our anterior anal groove. Again, that's specific to our deer tick genus um, versus the more common posterior anal groove that we'll observe on other tick species. All right, so now we'll get back kind of into just some general tick um, information. So do you want to point out, so this um, is usually everyone's favorite to identify. This is our Amblyoma americanum, so this is the lone star tick. So you can see it has just this single white marking on its sputum. So this is one where that ornamentation is really helpful for identification purposes. So uh, important facts about ticks, um, females can produce several thousand um, eggs at, in a given clutch. Um, and so generally the ticks, they're not going to um, go through many clutches of eggs, um, but when they are ready to release those eggs, it's going to be a massive number. Um, and so we obviously, with just a few ticks in a particular area, can end up with a really, really high level infestation. And again, you know, the ticks will leave their host to lay those eggs. So the eggs are gonna be present in the environment. Um, so a tick is not gonna lay eggs on uh, a particular host. They will leave the animal to do that. And then what happens between either our molts or if it's a one host tick only in larval stage, those ticks, when they hatch from the egg, they're gonna hang out in the environment and just wait for the right host to come along. So ticks do exhibit specificity, and that varies from tick genus to genus. Um, so some are much more specific to a certain host than others. Um, if we think about the deer tick, so um, those really do prefer to feed on deer. The adult ticks really like deer um, versus the larval and nymphal stages prefer smaller uh, mammals like mice and um, rabbits, that sort of thing. So they do have some preferences, uh, and so that can also play a role in some of our control methods. Um, but they exhibit this behavior known as questing, and so when those ticks are in the environment, when they're waiting to get onto their host, they will climb up to the tips of vegetation, and that's going to be the preferred host dependent, right? So if they're trying to get onto a mouse, they don't need to crawl up very high versus if they're trying to get onto a deer or a cow, they need to get a little bit higher in order to drop onto that host. And then when the host walks by, it's giving off some CO2 as well as visual cue changes in light level um, and some different odors. And that's a signal to that tick to jump off of whatever vegetation it's on to land on the host. Um, so pretty impressive um, host hunting behavior um, in terms of our parasite uh, organisms. All right, so getting into some of the more important things, um, ticks as vectors. So uh, really our, our big concern with ticks, so I did mention that a really high level infestation, we can have anemia, but that's really not our, our primary concern when it comes to ticks. So we're more concerned about is them um, vectoring pathogens between animal um, host species. And the concern is there because ticks are really, really good vectors. So they have a few characteristics that make them kind of a prime uh, carrier of disease. So they attach really securely to their hosts. You saw those mouth parts, so those are going to be firmly anchored into that host. So they're hanging on, they're not something that the animal can just swish their tail and 
um, knock this parasite off, they're really like anchored into that host. So that's one factor. They feed for a significant amount of time. So um, if we think about some of our other ectoparasites like flies, those are gonna be feeding very intermittently, taking very small blood meals. They're not staying attached to the host for very long compared to a tick where that tick might be on the host for up to a week taking a blood meal. And so basically the more time that we have an ectoparasite attached to a host, and particularly where we have them specifically securely attached that host feeding the whole time, um, the more opportunity for a pathogen to move from within that tick into our host. Uh, in general, they feed on a variety of hosts, so we can have certain um, animals serving as a reservoir of disease for other host species. So again, Lyme disease is a really good example of that, where um, some of our smaller mammals are serving as the reservoir to infect deer, humans, horses, etc. Um, and then lastly, they're very long-lived. So again, these ticks can live for several years, so even if there isn't an appropriate host um, in the environment for that tick to pass a disease to uh, maybe one season if, if animals move into that area or if the tick moves to an area where there are more animals and can still have the spread of disease. So other things to keep in mind, um, not ticks are suitable vectors for all pathogens. So just because something is vectored or transmitted by a tick doesn't mean that every type of tick is going to transmit disease. So I know I've already used Lyme disease as an, as an example several times, but it really is a good one in terms of disease dynamics. So exos, which we have pictured here, this is our deer tick, also known as the black leg tick. Um, that is a very good vector for Lyme disease other ticks do not transmit that bacteria. So it, it really can be very highly specific. So the vector tick needs to be a competent host for the pathogen. That means that that bacteria, that virus, that parasite needs to be able to survive and potentially even replicate in the tick. And then that infected tick needs to then feed on a competent host. So on a host where that uh, virus, bacteria, parasite can survive and multiply and actually cause disease. Um, and then we need those to both be occurring in the same region, right? So we need the competent vector tick with the competent um, host species to be in an overlap, overlapping geographic range. So if any of those factors is missing, um, the disease transmission is not going to occur. And that's why we have diseases like Lyme disease being really prevalent in certain regions and basically absent from others. Same with um, things like babesiosis in cattle. So really prevalent where we have the right disease dynamics and then basically absent from other regions. And that's why it's so important to control the spread of ticks so that we don't have um, increasing ranges for those diseases to spread. Okay, so now we're gonna jump into ticks that are relevant here in Iowa. So, um, there's really two that are gonna be our primary ticks of concern um, that are here now uh, that are gonna impact cattle. So those are Dermacenter variabilis, that's gonna be our dog tick. And then we have Amblyoma americanum, which I've mentioned, and that is the Lone Star tick. While we have these images up, I do just want to point out again, so Amblyoma has these really long mouth parts, and then we'll compare that to Dermacenter, where those mouth parts are um, really short in comparison, so good side by side there. And then there also are two um, invaders that we need to keep our eye out. So one, the topic of tonight's talk is going to be that Haemophysalis longicornis, that's the invasive Asian longhorn tick. And then another tick that we need to be aware of um, is Ripicephalus. So I mentioned this as well earlier. Um, this is the um, cattle fever tick that's responsible for transmitting babesiosis um, in that, uh, primarily in Mexico, but it kind of uh, occasionally drifts into Texas at the border. So Dermacenter, the American dog tick, is going to be an ornate tick. So 
we have, um, again, that white coloration on the sputum. Um, and then we have short mouth parts and we have uh, the presence of those festoons. So I would say I'm in Ames um, and these are, account for probably at least 95% of the ticks that I come across. So um, when I'm out walking my dogs, if I tick, I'm willing to bet money that it's gonna be dermacenter. Um, so again, that varies. Um, ticks have preferences not only for hosts, but also for the type of environment that they're in. Um, so I think Dermacenter just prefers the type of environments that I walk my dogs in, kind of that typical brushy, longer grass um, sort of environment. So these are one that um, I'm sure if you found ticks on your cattle or other pets before, um, you've likely come across Dermacenter. So Dermacenter, specifically the species variabilis, is going to be present primarily in uh, the eastern half of the U.S. So there are other Dermacenter species that are going to be present um, in kind of the Rocky Mountain and um, western portion of the U.S. So if you like to just think about it, the Dermacenter really is going to be found um, basically in the entire U.S. And so some important things to be aware of with Dermacenter, um, uh, they are hosts for anaplasmus, so the bacterium anaplasma. Um, and so uh, you may be aware of that disease um, occurs in Iowa. We don't tend to have high, high case numbers, but certainly with kind of changing weather dynamics, one to really be aware of and be diligent about tick control. Um, so what is good in terms of anaplasmosis and, and tick uh, vectoring of that disease is that the small mammals that are hosts for larval and nymphal ticks are not known to carry anaplasma. So that means that disease transmission is really limited to the adult stage. So we're likely only going to find adult stage dermacenter feeding on cattle. So the females will feed on one cow. Um, they're going to feed to repletion, and then they will fall off of that host and go um, lay their clutch of eggs. So because they're only feeding on one mammal, and these ticks are not getting infected at the larval or nymphal stage, females are not likely to significantly contribute to the spread of anaplasmosis. The concern for disease transmission is more um, when it comes to the male ticks. So male ticks are gonna feed more intermittently in the adult stage. So they may um, get on a host feed for a few days, hop off, do their thing in the environment, um, and then find another host. And so in that case, if we um, had them around a group of cattle and they're moving from animal to animal, um, then they could be spreading anaplasmosis through that herd. Um, the prevalence of anaplasma in dermacenter ticks in Iowa is not established at this time. Um, it is something that there is some interest in um, at, the, at the D-Lab and, and with some other groups, so potentially something that a, a survey will be conducted um, within the next few years. Um, but at the time, it's just unclear if those ticks are really contributing as much as we know that some of our fly species are. Um, so something to be aware of and probably more to come on that front um, in the future. So the next tick that we'll talk about in Iowa is going to be amblyoma. Um, so this is the lone star tick, again, so named because we have this bright gold spot on sputum of females. The males don't have that single spot, but they have kind of these yellow um, markings down at the bottom of the sputum. So amblyoma um, really, and our, our range is kind of always expanding when it comes to ticks, but these were traditionally thought of kind of as a tick of the southeast. Um, obviously, now they are reaching into the Midwest, um, and so I have found these in Ames. They are around, um, probably more prevalent in some of the southern regions of the state, um, but certainly one to be aware of in Iowa.
Um, amblyoma, in terms of cattle disease transmission, not as much of a concern. So they seem to be a competent vector for our um, cattle anaplasmosis. Um, so dermacenter is going to be more of a concern for our tick species in terms of disease control, but um, certainly one that you still want to be aware of. Um, I think regardless of which tick is present, it's a good idea to sort of be aware of what tick is in your area. So like I said, I pretty much only find dermacenter uh, and that gives me a better idea of what um, diseases maybe are going to be present in this, uh, in my particular region. So now we will talk about our invaders. So um, I know the information that everybody has been wanting. So Haemophysalis, our Asian longhorn tick, and then I'll briefly mention Rhipsephalus um, because sometimes I identification between those two can be uh, slightly tricky. So Haemophysalis longicornis is the Asian longhorn tick. So it's native to Asia. Uh, it did invade um, Australia, New Zealand, um, as well as some other countries and is now found in more than 15 states within the US. So at this point, uh, eradication is not considered feasible. So it's got already spread to too many places. Um, the USDA does not envision us being able to stamp out this tick. Um, it was first identified in the US in 2017 and that was um, on sheep in New Jersey. However, when um, the lab actually here, the NBSL lab um, in Ames, when they went back, looked at some of their uh, cataloged specimens, they actually found that they had misidentified a couple of other Haemophysalis uh, species. And so it's possible that it was actually here as early as 2010. So um, not only does that mean it was probably here earlier than we thought, that means it's probably also in more places than we think it is. Um, so identifying ticks in new locations relies on people submitting samples and those samples being accurately identified. And so if people don't have a reason to be concerned about a tick that they found, um, it's not gonna get to a lab. And so um, I will encourage all of you, if you um, are interested at all, to please send in any ticks that you find. Um, even if you don't necessarily think it's an invasive species, it does still provide us with information about what um, ticks are present, which is important for thinking about disease control. Um, and then sometimes we're surprised at what we find. So um, definitely encourage everyone, uh, if you ever have any ticks on your cattle to certainly um, send them our way. I really enjoy doing tick IDs. So happy to look at those any day. Um, so the Asian longhorn tick feeds on a variety of hosts. It does seem to prefer larger hosts. So, and that's at all um, of those life cycle stages. So even our smallest larval ticks for Haemophysalis are gonna prefer a larger host. Um, and so that's fairly unique and also a challenge when it comes to disease control, because again, if we have larval, nymphal, and adult stage ticks feeding on a similar host species, that is going to increase the odds of, trans, of disease transmission. And Haemophysalis is a potential vector for um, anaplasma, Ehrlichia, Babesia, as well as several viruses. So um, it's established as a vector for several viruses um, and other uh, pathogens uh, kind of in Asia and in the other countries where it's found. And so now the work that's being done is to determine uh, its capability of spreading the diseases currently here. So um, likely this is one that will contribute to um, anaplasmosis that we already have present in the U.S. Um, it could result in um, transmission of Babesia outside of that uh, kind of contagion at the Mexico-Texas uh, border. Um, and then additionally, it could, um, if we have more reintroductions from other countries, we could be seeing new uh, diseases coming into the U.S. and affecting our livestock. So 
um, a lot of concern there for um, disease spread whenever we have a new uh, vector host present. Uh, important to note, there are all the other Haemophysalis species that are present in the U.S., um, but they tend to stay on uh, non non cattle, non lives coasts. So um, feed on smaller mammals like rabbits, and then also birds. So um, Haemophysalis as a genus was established in the U.S. Particularly, the species of Longicornis is what was the actual invader. And a few more specifics on morphology and then just some interesting facts uh, about this tick. So um, an important thing to know about this tick is that the females can actually reproduce without mating. Um, so that's known as parthenogenesis. And that's really bad when it comes to an invasive species because basically that means even if a single female is introduced to a new region, it can lay a couple thousand eggs and suddenly we have an established population. Um, and so basically that made the spread of this tick um, likely easier um, and it would make the eradication of this even more of a challenge because even if we just miss one single female, she could potentially go on to establish a full new population. Um, that also impacts um, the level of infestation that we can have in a particular production area. So um, if we have just, you know, a few ticks that get introduced to a, a population of cattle, say, um, but then all of those females are laying a couple thousand eggs at a time, we can end up with really heavy infestations in a fairly small area. And so that means we may end up having issues like anemia in our host species um, if we're having really high levels of tick infestation. So um, anytime you have an animal that seems like they may be kind of a little too quiet, if they seem um, to not be doing well, uh, always smart to just check the outside of that animal, um, look to see if there is a heavy tick infestation. Um, I mean, those by hand curative, it can get pretty tiring if there are um, several hundred ticks on an animal. Um, but we also have some chemical control options as well um, for treating those high level infestations. Um, one potentially positive thing about Haemophysalis is that it does appear to be less attractive to humans than some of our other ticks. So that doesn't mean that it won't bite and feed on humans, um, but it seems to prefer animal hosts to humans. So um, maybe a bit of a plus. So uh, Haemophysalis has been found, again, in many states, I think we're up to about 17 now, um, primarily in the Eastern US. However, if you'll note, um, Missouri and Arkansas are both on here. So again, Missouri is getting a, a little close for comfort. So um, I, it's more a matter of when this tick is found in Iowa. I don't think it's I don't think it's likely that we will be able to keep it out. It's possible it's already here and simply hasn't been identified. Um, so obviously we have more kind of in these um, eastern regions. Some of that is skewed just because when it was first identified in New Jersey, they started doing a lot of surveillance for ticks um, in the eastern U.S. They already have a lot of tick surveillance because Lyme disease is such a significant issue out there. Um, and so they maybe just found more of these, whereas in um, some of the Western and Midwestern regions of the US, uh, if we're not looking for them specifically, then we're not gonna find them to report them. Uh, in terms of hosts, so um, you can see that the vast majority of ticks were found in the environment. So. Again, that's likely just due to the surveillance efforts. So um, when doing tick surveillance, usually what's done is a uh, tick drag. And so you take basically a white sheet and you walk around and then you look at that sheet to find what ticks are on it and then you can identify them. Um, and so those obviously are gonna be environmental samples versus those that are actually found on a host animal. Um, cans, a lot have been found on deer, um, dogs, humans, 
I think ticks found on humans are probably more likely to be submitted for identification um, versus those that are pulled off of animal hosts, um, just because there's maybe uh, more concern for um, potential disease transmission. Um, but again, you can see kind of a really wide range of um, host species that have been found to be infested with uh, the Asian longhorn tick. Uh, here's just kind of map view. So again, kind of primarily this eastern, southeastern United States, but again, Arkansas and Missouri. So we're getting pretty close to Iowa. Um, and again, you can almost looks like it skips over a bunch of land. So um, likely there, this is probably a more continuous uh, distribution um, and we're simply just haven't found those ticks yet. So we spoke a little bit about um, some of the diseases that are currently here, things like anaplasmosis. Um, another uh, disease that we need to be concerned about with um, Haemophysalis longicornis is Tyleria. So the last documented case of Tyleriosis in the United States was in 2000, so uh, more than 20 years ago. And then in 2017, there was a herd of um, cattle in Virginia. They, based on clinical signs that they had anaplasmosis, and it ended up being identified as this um, Tyleria orientalis. And so Unfortunately, our hemophysalis friends have been found to be capable vectors for um, this disease. And so, um, again, what we can see, not only do we have this tick invading the U.S., we can have that tick bringing with it diseases and then expanding the range uh, of these transmission um, into new areas. So, um, kind of a double whammy for concerns when we have introduction of a vector host species. Okay, so um, we're going to touch a little bit on Ripocephalus, and then I'll give you the side-by-side -side to show some of that um, morphologic confusion can come into play. Uh, probably uh, not something you need to be too worried about, but something that really confuses vets when we um, present this information. So Ripocephalus ticks are not present in Iowa. Um, they ha are basically, um, they have attempted to eliminate them um, from this uh, quarantine zone in, at the Texas-Mexico border. Um, and that's again because of cattle fever. So um, basically trying to keep uh, bovine babesiosis out of the United States. Um, so Ripocephalus is the uh, tick that transmits that disease to cattle. Again, this is the one that I mentioned, one host tick. So these ticks are going to stay on a single host. And so what they do in this whole um, zone, this whole quarantine zone, they have cattle dip tanks um, where basically they will run any cattle through um, those tanks and it, it contains... Um, uh, our sites, so something that's going to kill the ticks, and uh, basically we eliminate those ticks from the animals to prevent kind of further spread of eosis into Texas, where um, it could obviously then be spread further into the United States. So, um, again, Ripocephalus one to be aware of because if you have cattle moving between states, you just never know what they might be carrying with them. Um, so always keep in mind that when animals move, they're moving with their parasites. Um, so if you ever have animals coming in from um, another region, always important to kind of keep an eye on maybe what um, ectoparasites they're bringing with them so that we don't introduce anything exciting into Iowa. So where the confusion can come in with these two ticks uh, between Ripocephalus and Haemophysalis is that they both have kind of this flared pointy region. Um, but if we look closely, it's actually two different spots on the tick. So when we're talking about Ripocephalus, if you remember me mentioning this basis capitulum, Ripocephalus has a hexagonal basis capitulum. So that's this structure here, which is the same as this one. So Haemophysalis, it's square, rectangular, 
um, versus ripocephalus, it's going to point out. And that is in contrast with the region on hemophysalis that flares out. Um, that's actually the palps or the mouth parts. And so basically at first glance, because both of these ticks are inornate, so um, they don't have any uh, markings on them to make them more um, obvious to be one or the other. So really we end up relying on um, the shape of the basis capitulum and then the um, a flaring of that palp in order to um, make the identification. So again, probably not something that you will ever look at just so that you get a little behind the scenes action um, of tick ID um, and some of the stuff that can confuse vet students when working on um, and then here is just kind of another couple of comparisons. So um, Dermacenter, again, that's going to be kind of our probably most common tick in Iowa. So we have rectangular basis capitulum, similar in hemophysalis. And then when we look at ripocephalus has these points here. Um, and then both of these two, ripocephalus and Dermacenter, have these fairly smooth palps. Um, but then when we look at hemophysalis, those are going to flare out quite a bit. Um, so again, these are pretty tricky things to notice unless you're looking at a tick under a microscope. So that's why it's very important um, if you have any concern or, or even if you just want to do your own little surveillance, um, send in ticks for identification. Um, if you want to work with your veterinarian to do that, if you want to send them directly to us, um, whatever is easier. Um, we are happy to facilitate that. All right, so what do you do if you suspect you have found hemophysalis? Um, contact your veterinarian. Then, um, you know, we don't expect everyone to be able to ID all of these different ticks. Um, so if you come across an animal that has, you know, several ticks in their ear, maybe just pluck a few of those off, pop them in a bag, um, and send them to either your vet or to us. Um, to have us ID those. Because really, if we just do some routine surveillance, that's often the way that we discover these invasive species. So um, the more ticks that we look at, the better idea we have of, of what the status of those ticks are in Iowa. Um, and we can hopefully stay ahead of these new species coming in. So these ticks are well established in um, some of the states that we talked about. However, hemophysalis, we still haven't identified it in Iowa, so it is still of a lot of interest if we do find it here. Um, I would love to be involved. If, if it does make it here, I'd like to be involved in finding it because then I can publish a case report about it, being the first in Iowa. Um, so if, if that is maybe some motivation for all of you to send ticks my way, um, would have played it as a um, starving graduate student. Um, but again, so we do really want to track where these are moving. And so basically we need the help of producers, um, of any animal owners really, to be sending ticks our way so that we can have an idea of um, whether or not these hemophysalis ticks have made it into our state. All right, so this is my last slide, I think. Uh, so just want to touch on um, tick control. So. Um, in terms of chemical treatment, we have a few different options. Um, pyrethrins, pyrethroids, those are two um, very similar compounds. Uh, one is kind of the natural form and then one is a, a synthetic form, um, but basically they behave very similarly. So um, things like perbethrin, those are going to have an effect kind of on a wide range of arthropods. So um, permethrins are uh, really regarded as a very good um, tick control option for uh, livestock species. Keep in mind that um, permethrin specifically, um, the synthetic pyrethroids, is toxic in cats. So be sure that you're um, careful if you're applying that um, to cattle or to um, uh, an area where animals are going to be, um, that there are not cats having access to that um, equipment or product. Organophosphates can be effective. Those are, um, I mentioned the dip tanks that are used um, more commonly in Texas. So it's not as common here. They are effective. So it's an option if you wanted to implement that. Uh, avermectin, so that's going to be cons like 
ivermectin and doramectin, um, those do kill ticks. They tend to have a slower speed of kill. So if you have an animal who has a really heavy infestation and is um, potentially anemic from the level of ticks, those probably aren't gonna be your best bet for a quick treatment, um, but they can be really effective in kind of controlling tick levels. And then it's generally accepted that killing ticks within 24 to 48 hours of them attaching to a host or removing that tick from the host will prevent disease transmission. This may or may not be completely accurate, but basically the sooner we can get those ticks off of an animal, the less likely disease transmission is. All right, okay, I lied. It wasn't the last slide. I apologize. <laughs> um, so next step in tick control is going to be um, environmental control. So if you reduce the environment um, that those ticks prefer to live in, so um, doing things like removing tall grasses, brush piles, that sort of thing, um, that gives them less of a reason to be in that area. And decreasing encroachment by wild animals, um, these are things that yeah, sounds great, but in practice is not always very feasible. So do what you can, where you can. Um, you never know what might make enough of a difference to prevent um, disease spread. And here I have pictured um, some of our ticks favorite hosts. So not necessarily for Haemophysalis, as I said, they like a larger host. So probably just this guy here, the deer. Um, but again, these animals are pretty hard to keep out of um, in the area where there are um, other animals and that enticing um, environment. So um, anywhere these guys are, there's gonna be ticks. All right, and then just wanted to show kind of to, um, I don't know, just leave you with a little, a little bit of thought. Um, so this is a map of Iowa back in the 1800s. You can see we have primarily prairie land. Um, and so at this point, tick habitat was basically the entire state. Now with um, as much agriculture as we have in the state, um, we have kind of reduced the um, tick habitat, which in some ways is good, right? If they have less area to be in, but it has also kind of concentrated them in certain areas. Um, and so we actually have them um, maybe more uh, prevalent around some of these urban areas where there is still some grassland. Um, and, and forest area. Um, and so basically we've just, we have really changed the dynamics of this uh, parasite um, through uh, kind of the intensity of agriculture in this state. So just something to kind of out um, when you're uh, evaluating what type of land is around you, um, maybe where you want to target any tick control. Um, so basically, you know, if you don't have um, land that is very conducive to uh, tick survival and transmission, then probably you don't need to be specifically treating for um, those parasites either. All right, so that is all I have for you. I hope it was informative. I am happy to take any questions that you have. Um, I'll do my best to answer those. And then also just want to leave you um, with our um, contact information. So my email is here. Please feel free to email me um, any questions that you have. Happy to chat parasites all day, every day. Um, so you can email me directly. Uh, Dr. Brewer's email is here as well. Um, so he's really the true expert. Um, this parasite at iowastate.edu, that might be the easiest one to remember. That'll go to both of us. Um, and then just so you're aware, some some of the services that we offer at Iowa State for um, parasitology, um, fecal floats, uh, bearmans, looking at larvae, um, organism identification, and more. So um, happy to work with you, with your veterinarians, um, anything to uh, meet your parasitology uh, needs. Do I recommend preventative treatment or treatment upon finding hosts uh, or finding ticks on host cattle? So I would say um, prevention is generally um, preferred as long as it can be done in a way that is uh, kind of judicious use of those compounds. So um, what's nice is that most of our ectoparasites are going to be um, 
treated with the same product. So we can use things like permethrin or ivermectin to target both um, flies as well as ticks. So I would say um, you may need to do the timing of some of those treatments, um, but I would say if we maybe just shift some of that up a little bit earlier into the year, those can be used to target ticks. Um, and then if, if we maybe need additional treatments later when flies are more of a concern, um, but you can kind of control for both of those at the same time. So um, I definitely think um, using some of that preventative treatment, but um, I don't like encourage people to go too far overboard because we don't wanna end up with resistance. So it's, it's always a little bit of a balancing act, but again, why it's important to be aware of is abuse. So maybe, depending on what your pastures look like, maybe ticks really aren't that much of a concern. Um, and then you don't need to worry too much about um, a high level of uh, prevention. But if they are a concern in your area, then getting ahead of them is always going to be better. Are more in specific seasons? When should we be checking cattle? Um, so they are going to start emerging as soon as it starts to get warm out. So one of those things where it's a little bit earlier every year. So I would say, um, trying to remember when I found my first tick last year, it surprised me at how early it was. I think it might've even been in April. Um, so certainly late spring, early summer, we can already have pretty high levels of ticks. So, um, you know, you don't need to be out there combing every animal, but certainly just to observe. Um, and if you start seeing them, then certainly that may be a time where you may want to um, apply some of those products. So I would say uh, late spring, early summer is when those are going to be um, starting to emerge. Oh, remind us where to send tick samples. So um, I certainly want to encourage you to work directly with your veterinarians. We never want to take away um, interactions with them. So certainly you can coordinate um, with your veterinarian. Otherwise, um, feel free to, to email us um, or you can go um, to the Iowa State, um, uh, if you even if you just Google Iowa State Parasitology, um, we should pop up and that should give you some um, sample submission guidelines. Um, those can be mailed kind of directly to us at Iowa State. 